Okay, welcome back. Um, just going to try and smash out as many videos as I can uh, this weekend. Um, um, today, this next one, uh, we're going to do a something different for me. We're going to do an actual lens review. This is the um, Kippon Ibelux 40mm f0.85 for Fuji X mount. Yes, f0.85 and it is an absolute beast of an honestly i could work out with this lens it weighs 1.2 kilograms it is solid just solid metal and glass lead maybe maybe it's radioactive i have no idea honestly it is an absolute beast of a lens we're going to talk about that lens today and i'm not really going to apologize for the length of this video there isn't actually a lot of intel on this lens around um I, I when i was researching this lens i only found you know two or three sources so i'm hoping that going into a little bit of nerdy depth about this lens will be useful for some people who are trying to um, learn more about this lens um but before we get right into it i'm gonna just we're just gonna jump into my browser and i'm just going to show you how this story came to be and how i ended up here um with this actual lens in my hand because i think that's kind of interesting as well in itself so let's do that now okay so here we are at um this website um from alec griffin um i think i'm saying that right alec griffin and it's a fantastic website and this is how i discovered um this kippon lens so he's got a really good place where you can go to lenses and just get a list of all the different types of uh, lenses that are available for the fuji x mount which is the camera i have and as you can see he's kind of categorized them into autofocus and manual focus and even the chinese third party and that is where you see the kippon now the interesting thing about this is i think the design is german based but manufactured in chinese for kippon and um, other ones i can't can't speak of but here's where I found out about this um, really super fast um, f0.85 uh, lens. And there's been a few iterations of this lens. There's been the Mark, uh, the first one, the Mark II, and now the Mark III, which is one I'm reviewing today. So if you do go on to um, Alex's website, I definitely recommend you have a browse through all of this and um, get to know, I mean, really, his pros here, he, he, gets, he gets straight to the point. Um, extremely shallow depth of field, very creamy, puffy bokeh. Nice corner and edge performance when stopped down. Sharp in the center and great bokeh all apertures. 100% agree with absolutely everything he's just said. And this is just for the Mark II version, but it's the same is true um, for the, the third. It does uh, have CA wide open and there is a highlight set to bloom and vignetting is strong at f 0 0.85 to 1 and it is big and it is heavy he's that's the end of the review honestly guys honestly that i mean he he's you know it's straight to the point um but you do i do recommend you go through his website and have a look at all the things um that he talks about and the same he's actually done an updated one for the version 3 as well so definitely check out that um what i wanted to just sort of uh, and ignore all my tabs by the way okay i won't I won't hear a single thing, negative thing said about these tabs are important. I mean, this one, for example, is a quick way to get, you know, a cat emoji. I find these, this stuff's very important. But um, I think no, really, in all honesty, when it comes to um, lens reviews, if you actually read what Alec is talking about um, with this, these lenses, I wholeheartedly agree. And he does make a point somewhere. I can't remember where it is, but he does make a point that you know, this is a, not a lens that might score very well, um, it, but it is absolutely got It renders so beautifully. Um, it's the sort of thing that a lot of YouTubers and other reviewers, I'll not name them, but if you go looking for information about this lens, they don't actually give it a lot of uh, credibility. Um, it's, it's quite often um, given actually quite negative because it won't score well. And I, and I think it's a real shame because we've moved into an age today where unless your lens scores well, it's not going to get any traction. And it's a real shame because we're missing an entire other side of photography, I think. Um, but anyway, we can we can talk a little bit more about that later. But I, I fell in love with Alec and his images and what he was saying about this lens. And then I realized the cost. It is a whopping 1780. I mean, it, US dollars. I mean, on the B&H website, it's the same thing again. And, you know, if I convert that to Aussie dollars, I'm getting close to, you know, $3,000 basically, if we're including 
customs, excise, shipping, things like that. So expensive um, for what this really is. So, um, you know, I did what any, any, any good YouTuber would do is, you know, I reached out to them and I said, look, I've got a whopping 700 subscribers. Do you have any idea of the reach I have? If you were to send this lens to me, heavily discounted or free, I will give you a glowing review. So yeah, that's what this is basically. Actually, no, these, these, this, this review is of, you know, my own impressions of it. It's not paid promotion. I did get a discount on, on, on the lens in agreement for doing a review on it, but, um, keep on, I'm not seeing this review ahead of you. It's uh, my thoughts and I'm going to criticize it as much as I'm going to give it praise as well. It's going to be very fair, fair review of this lens. But I think, yeah, I'm not going to, not going to um, rush through it because there's not a lot of information about this lens if you go out on the internet and have a look. So hopefully this will come as a, a useful resource for somebody who's looking to know and understand more about this lens. So how we're going to go about this is I'm just going to really talk about the lens. Uh, go to Alex's um, website if you want to have a little bit more of a pixel peep at things like image quality, corner sharpness, center sharpness, stuff like that. I'm not really going to do that today. I'm just going to give you my thoughts on this lens after using it for um, a number of months. I've um, got quite a lot to go through, so I'm going to go quite quick paced because I want to try and get this video at least you know, try and get it under 30 minutes, right? Fat chance, but let's just, let's just try. So I'm, I've done the intro. I've kind of explained how I got onto it and now the why, okay. So why get this lens? Um, this, this is because this is something I feel semi-passionate about with photography is there's a trend at the moment that lenses don't get traction unless they, unless they are scoring excellently in tests. Um, you know, it's like this new Fujinon X 18 mil F 1.4 absolutely beautiful lens really beautiful um i've got no beef with it at all i think it's incredible that for the size and weight and the fact it's got all focus and good autofocus so that fuji has managed to make a lens like this for customers it's insane to me that at f1.4 the edges and corners are really good good quality. And I saw this similar trait with the XF 50 mil F1 that was considered buying also, and may still buy some, some point down the line, but there is something I think with these type of clinical resolving lenses, um, that I find somewhat odd at times in certain images. And it's a hard, hard thing to kind of put into words, but I would, I find it, you know, if you have a portrait, for example, and it's just on one person, then I quite like that one person being, you know, good sharpness, good image quality, and then for the rest of the frame to fall apart. Sorry, inverted commas. So meaning that, you know, the corners and edges are a little bit soft at those areas because I feel as though it, it pulls the attention a little bit more towards the subject. So this is, you know, people, I've, I've, it's really, like I say, it's hard to explain. I've, I've seen portraits of somebody maybe leaning on a rail, for example, and them and the rail are in focus, but the rail extends right across the frame. And the rail image quality on the left and right is incredibly good and, and almost throws the attention away from where it needs to be, which is on the person in the middle of, of, the, of the frame. Um, I don't know if you've ever come across this in photography as well, but that's, that's just how I feel about it. Now, so that's what this lens is not. It will not give you awesome image quality throughout the frame at these wider apertures, but it certainly does give you very good um, image quality in the middle, in the center, at those wide apertures, more than acceptable for, for good um, images, good content. And I feel as though a lot of YouTubers, when they go and they've had, they've got, they've got a huge um, subscriber base, they've got a huge influence, they will, you know, just look at this from a test performance perspective and those youtubers those same youtubers as well probably you know you don't actually know what their photography skills are like and their work is like because they never actually share that kind of stuff they just talk about gear all the time and i think that's a real shame because i think they're they're missing because at the end of the day we, we don't care about these charts and these tests we care about the image the photograph that we're looking at is it good or is it bad and of course there's lots of things that go into that such as the skill of the photographer what the tools they were able to work with at the time the lighting the composition the content it goes on the list goes on and on and on so those are the things that really ultimately matter not the gear per se sometimes the gear can help you get to shot but yeah another topic for another day but that's the point i'm trying to say and when i was on alex website i was just falling in love with the images I was seeing from this lens and feeling as though they were very indifferent to what 
really kind of Fujinon would produce and even some other third party Chinese manufacturers like the Mikaton uh, F0.95 and Camlan 1.1, which are awesome lenses as well in their own right. But um, I just felt as though what I was seeing here was a unique look, okay, a unique look. So that would be number one is this lens has a unique look. I think you, I think we could shoot the XF 50mm F1, we could do a Mikaton 095 and we could do this lens and we can have some comparisons at different apertures and I think you will start to see a look from this lens. Now I'm not saying it's kind of like a, a lens baby-esque type, type look to the, um, the images, it's, but I do feel as though it's got a, an artistic, you know, stamp on it, you know, it, it twirl to its effect, you know. But what I also really like about this lens is it, it is also, it, I kind of consider it a hybrid lens. It also behaves itself. It's a grown up mature adult when you want it to be. Once you've had your fun with those wide aperture shots, once you start stopping down even to something like F2 or 2.8 or something, you'd be surprised at you know, how uniformed and incredibly the, good the image quality is from corners to corner, um, edge to edge. So yeah, I really love that about lens. And I and I often find some lenses like the, um, the new Nocturne, Voigtlander um, 23mm f1.2. I'm loving what I'm seeing from that lens at those wide open apertures, but I've seen a lot now to suggest that the field curvature is quite poor in that lens when it's stopped down at sort of f5, f8, that you're not actually going to get very, very good image quality across the entire frame in a, in a uniform sense. So that lens to me feels a little bit more like an expensive one trick pony, but I, I could be talking crap. It's only I'm going by what I've seen and discussions I've seen online. Um, I've pixel peeped other people's images, but it's all it's secondhand um, observations. If if uh, Voigtlander wants to send me that lens, I'd be happy to test it. Um, but that's um, but yeah. So just to get back to the Kipon, this lens is does have excellent image quality um, throughout the frame and 0.85. You could be f mistaken for being soft, but when you get it right, you will see those eyelashes or whatever you're framing being very sharp and very noticeable. It's just you are not used to seeing f0.85 basically. I mean, this is like this is like a equivalent of a 60 mil f1.2 in full frame terms. So yeah, it's it's something that is definitely needs to be mentioned. I'm just going to go through my list. Um, I think also we can't really um, move past the fact that because it has this fast aperture, it also leads to high image quality from a perspective of ISO or noise. If you are shooting in low light or any other situation where maybe other lenses that are 1.4, 1.8, f2 or something, they might carry that ISO 1600 to 3200 um, with those images because the shutter speed needs to be a certain amount, you know, for that particular context. This is where this um, lens can really help um, keep, the, keep the image quality because it can actually shoot so low and, and so fast. Excuse me. Um, yes, uh, do, 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 do. Um, of course, yes. Yeah, so I've mentioned that it is like a 60 mil f1.2 in full frame terms in terms of depth and rendering, but it's got the 0 0.85 light gathering capabilities. Duh. But yeah, let's just clarify that. Okay, so um, a pro is that it does have chromatic aberration. That's not a pro, but that it does seem to be clean and and, and gone by f1.4, which I think is really quite impressive. Um, other glass um, that Fujinon do, do may be the same, and their, their f1.4 also is really good and optically clean. But I, I think it's quite important to note that this one does seem to perform very good at 1.4. So even if you don't like those um, 0.85 bokeh or f1 and you like that 1.4 look more then you've got a very 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 good and capable f1.4 lens on your on your hands here that's really actually quite fun and, and, and enjoyable to use so definitely that's something to mention um da -da -da -da, i'm just looking through my notes yeah i've just put down here i'd be very interested to see how this lens performs on the new um Fujinon XH240 megapixel. So that's something quite different. I've only been able to test this on the um, X-T4 and the X-T32, which basically same image quality. So um, I can't speak of that yet. Maybe if I get the chance to pop down to um, Fuji head headquarters in Sydney, I'll take this lens with me and see if and anybody will let me have a play with that, that body and I'll do some sample shots and uh, maybe update this in the description below. Um, I will be doing a blog 
and I uh, will update the blog as time goes on with new images. I hope to use this um, on the odd occasion at uh, professional weddings and things like that. So when I, I get that chance, I will put those images in. So check in with the blog every now and then, maybe every year, have a little look and see if there's any more images in the in the blog section for this lens. Um, now, um, yeah, so it's it's a it's a I think you have to have a bit of a m mature approach with this lens um, with <clears throat> with its aperture. I mean, I was for the first week of owning it, I was just spamming it at 0 0.85 because it's so unique and I just wanted to test and see what it's like. But you you will have to understand photography to a certain degree with this lens and realize when does 0 f 8 0.5 really help and why would you shoot it at that aperture versus even f1 or 1.4 or f2 um i think it very much depends on the genre and as i was shooting this lens i was shooting my own kids that they are they get more gross and uglier as they get older but some of my friends have adorable young kids and i was shooting them and i started to realize this it looks really good for shooting um children if you're into child um portrait uh, photography newborns or something like that then this lens may really suit that genre really really well um so that's what I would just be saying about this lens here is do indeed sort of research whether, you know, you need that fast aperture in the lens and whether it works for your genre because it may pay for itself quite quickly if that's your field. Um, there are certain in instances where I was shooting <clears throat> and I had the subject in front of me and I had something going on in the background that was really distracting. I didn't want it in the frame. I didn't want them to know that there were, you know, I was in a museum or something, there was people behind or something like that. Um, you can, you can just blow that stuff to smithereens at f0.85 if you want. You can take a shot and, you know, just obliterate that information in the background. And that's that's a useful little thing to have and know you can do. I'm not sure. You, even going to f1, I could start to, or f1.4, I could start to see a context, you know, forms of shapes of people and things like that. This lens, you know, it can just blow all the way. Um, Okay, so, and really, honestly, um, the last thing I've got here is the bokeh fall off. And I think that's really what this lens is all about. Um, I think bokehs are really, I mean, maybe bokeh is the wrong word to use, maybe just out of focus transition is, is, is the real word I'm, I'm trying to talk about here. I think with optics, you, you will hear reviewers talking about the bokeh. Oh yeah, it's quite nice. It's quite dreamy or whatever like that. But I think they kind of skim over it, and it's such a major element, especially certain genres like portrait work. The um, what I discover, uh, or what I see quite a lot as being a modern trend, is that you will have some nice sharpness on the subject, but then the next thing that is behind them, the out of focus area, it just looks quite, I don't know, artificial or something. There could be a three D pop to it, but it's not a really good 3d pop it's a really hard thing to, to put into words um <clears throat> i found i found with this lens i don't know if i've used the lens in the past that has as beautiful a transition from from where you've nailed focus to close to where you've nailed focus for how it's rendering that that blur and to the next part a little bit past it so you know if you've got an eye and you know as it comes up to the ear and beyond that kind of that book of fall off i think is absolutely incredible with this lens i think it is one of the the, the, the strong traits that gives it this lens that unique look um that you're not seeing elsewhere in some other other lenses it's painterly i don't know i, I don't want to be corny and use kind of you know those types of words but it, it is something um that i have i have noted and i think it's one of its its strengths it's almost the entire point of this lens and it it brings the interesting question for me as to whether this lens is about being f0.85 or whether it's about the optical recipe because you can still see this fall off happening at say f1 or f1.4 as well it's it really is very very beautiful and um i wonder sometimes if if kipon um have scope to make another version like this but maybe an f95 or f1 f1.4 uh, or something like that because they do do some slower lenses they do have some f2.4 glass in their um in their lenses and i yeah i just wonder if there's scope for this lens to um be reduced in size and weight and cost but still hold on to that incredible image quality something to think about i don't know at the moment if i'm in love with the f8 point you know f.85 um, or just the actual rendering 
qualities of it. I think it's a bit of both. Um, so I think that's really it. That's really the pros for the lens in terms of image quality. Build quality, I know it's a Chinese lens, but I think it's engineered or designed in Germany. Um, I don't have a single gripe to say about the image quality. Focus ring is smooth. Aperture is uh, has clicks, but they're quite slight and gentle. I, I like the, um, it has a retractable lens hood that comes out and, and in and I think that's great I would love to see like I have a complaint with all lens is that once you take it out there's no way to kind of rotate it and click it or something like that um, I quite often do event work and I'll have my lens down in a pouch and if it, the retractable hood just goes back in on itself then that leaves the, the front element exposed um, so if there is a version 4 of this lens keep the keep the built-in hood it's great um just if there's a way to keep it up and out if it twisted that would that would be great um the other thing it comes with is a, a screw um lens cap and you know i this is a pro and con thing i mean on the one hand it does take a while to take it off right a long 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 time but on the other hand it does um i quite like a, a screw a screw lens cap for when I'm transporting the lens, um, I feel sometimes worried that the, the clip-on ones will just, you know, come off or something like that. And then that, that plastic lens cap is scraping the element. At least with a screw-on lens cap, you feel as though that's never going to happen. But at the same time, for the price we're paying for this lens, I kind of feel like maybe just chucking in a plastic one for us as well. So we could use, we could choose to use the plastic lens cap, but they're not cheap. You could buy one anyway if you really wanted one. Um, but I thought that was worth mentioning. The... Um, the other thing about the um, aperture ring is I sometimes wish that there was an f1.2 rather than it goes, it goes f0.85, f1, 1.4. And I don't know, we'll, I'll try and do, I might do some b-roll for this, but I'll, I'll, I'll try here at the moment. But I don't know if you can see that when you are doing the, the clicks, here we are at 0 0.85, it's such a small, that's it, I'm moving it and that is all I have to do till it goes to f0 and um, f1 so 0 0.85 f1 it's so slight and then from there it's 1.4 and you get you feel like you get bigger bigger leaps at the uh, other side of the aperture ring but the the places that are important i wouldn't mind a little bit more more room to move between going from say 0.85 to f1 uh, maybe I, maybe that's something you just can't get around with the optical design but um I would I would have liked an f1.2 because I, I sometimes feel so f1 has cleared up coma quite well f1.4 is all gone it looks like f1.2 is pretty much all gone as well and you hold on to a little bit more bokeh it's like you can still leave it hanging between f1 and f1.4 it kind of just feels like it'd be nice if there was a click there um what else was I saying in my notes um I think that is is really it Okay, con con list. All right, cost. Of course, it's exclusive. This price is so ridiculous that um, you know who's buying who's buying this lens. I mean, I and I said this in my letter to Kipon. I said, as somebody who does event work with Fuji, I do rely on autofocus lens. In fact, when I bought this Fuji XT4, I kind of said it was really all around based all around autofocus. And I promised myself I wouldn't, wouldn't buy a manual focus lens for it. And what do I go and do? I bought the most expensive one of all. Um, but it's not that manual focus is the prohibitive thing about this lens. The, the features of Fuji cameras to be able to punch in and zoom and focus peaking really do actually aid and help massively for the, the case usage. The biggest problem with this lens actually is, is its price. You have to justify it. It's so much money for what is essentially a specialist lens. I'm not going to run around and do an entire wedding with this lens. I'm not going to have a very good keeper rate doing that. And at 1.2 kilograms in weight, it's so heavy to put in your, you know, satchel or bag, or whatever you're wearing, as you go throughout on your person as you're going throughout a wedding day or an event it's a lot of it's a lot of additional weight for something that's probably going to come out only every now and then so um yeah i don't know what they can do about that um no weather sealing at this price point i would really like weather sealing its construction's absolutely fine um i don't know whether they can include um weather sealing gaskets or whatever but that would become a, a real welcome addition and i'm sure 
I have the same gripe with with Pentax glass that that I adore, but isn't weather sealed. And there, and you do start to notice there's a significant um, drop in images circulating around the internet of showing lenses being shot in the in the rain in the wet, and that's a shame because specular highlights from rain and wetness is is a glorious thing to render, and this lens probably would do it really, really, really great. Um, and one one other word about chroma as well with coma and aber aberrations i i don't get offended as much as others, others about it i really don't worry too much about shooting wide open especially if i'm monochrome if i'm shooting on the monochrome profile i don't care at all I, I won't worry about it you just if it's a dull overcast day i could quite easily shoot in color and at f0.85 and not really worry about coma either um, it's only when you get down to sort of um really really high contrast days you'll you might put out f1.4 to be safe and i think that's a wise choice to, to make um so again yeah so that's a con the con is it has chromatic aberrations um <clears throat> what else have i said um yeah one one interesting thing during my testing i did a couple of shots of my son where i was just shooting him st stationary from f1 point um f0.85 all the way through the apertures i noticed quite a significant color shift from wide open to stop down um I don't think this is the camera. I went and checked the raw files and, and even fixed the white balance throughout all of them. It just looked like there was a kind of difference in, in warmth or tint or something. Um, you can probably see in the, I'll, I'll throw up the shot here, but you can see his green jumper um, is looking very brown um, at the stop down apertures and it's quite green at the wide. There's a different, definite shift in, in colors there. It's just something for you to be aware of. Um, yeah, I think I have a I have said everything I want to say about this lens. Now, actually looking through my list here, I've mentioned the cons, which is cost, size, weight, no weather sealing. Personally, I like a focus ring that's a little bit um I don't know what the word to use is, but um I feel like I have to rotate the focus ring quite a lot to go between near and far. That's bad in some ways but once you get to the ballpark of where you want to get focused then you've got a little bit more scope to dial that in perfectly so it's kind of maybe a good thing but I'm okay with those focus rings you know where you you adjust a little and it actually shifts quite a lot I'm okay with those ones um I would personally prefer that in this lens just for a kind of usability perspective of being able to just walk around with it and quickly go between near and far and shoot and things like that but that's i think it's a personal i'm not going to put that as a con i think that's just like personal um preference um i'm i'm i've got quite good fine motor skills and i don't mind very delicate you know adjustments with the focus ring to, to nail focus but that's just me um just quickly just as i was editing this footage i realized i'd missed out on something that i thought was actually noteworthy and worth bringing up and that is uh, it's, it's, it's one of the cons um this doesn't have a very good minimum focus distance it's only 75 uh, centimeters and that's pretty poor um for of a focal length like this i would have liked it to be a lot closer as i was shooting portraits with it i often found myself wishing I could just go a little bit closer in because it is really quite interesting the the bokeh fall off and getting that shallow depth of field but um fortunately there's a pretty easy workaround I ended up investing in one of these little um filters this is like a plus one what does it say it's a plus one close up um this is just a really generic brand newer um nothing too special but um it just allows you to get in a lot closer to take those shots and i've just got it on a little uh, magnetic filter here so you know it comes off and just snaps on really easy so i tend to just have one of these on in my pocket or whatever when i'm on a shoot and if i want to get closer in i'll just show you quickly um on my mannequin the kind of differences so this first shot coming up that's what you get when you don't have this kind of diapeter on and you've just got it at the minimum focus distance that's how, about how close and how what it's going to look like um for the kind of portrait shot that you're doing so again you can understand why i'd like to get them a, a little bit tighter a little bit closer this next shot here shows what this looks like when you have this on with a minimum focus distance on the focus ring so this is how close you can get with a plus one uh close-up diopter 
And this next shot here shows you if I get the focus ring and go to infinity, and this is, you know, kind of how far back you can get from the subject as well. So it's quite good because you, you can basically, you know, put this on and do your session and do some close ups and come back to sort of half bodies and not worry too much about it. Um, I really haven't noticed much and deterioration in image quality from using this because um, it's fairly mild at plus one. I think there are some plus two, plus three, plus four magnification ones and they I think get worse and worse for image quality. And this is a fairly just cheap brand. I might at some point, um, I'll probably will at some point invest in a higher quality from a more uh, reputable um, brand for something like this. But yeah, I thought that was worth mentioning. So it's a nice workaround and it allows you to get these really nice close up portraits and uh, maybe I'll throw a couple of them up on the screen when I get around to editing this, or you can see them in the blog. I'll definitely include them in the blog. Um, but yeah, thought that was worth mentioning. So I'm um, back to the rest of the review. Ergonomically, it's okay, but be warned when it's sitting on, you know, something like um, my XT32 here, boom, 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 XT32. This is like a 300 gram, you know, um, camera. It's ridiculous. When I'll just put it on now. When it's on this, this camera body, it's so front heavy that I think ergonomically it's, it's pretty difficult to use. You know, it's just, it's just funny. It's just a strange, strange thing to look at. Ugh, I can feel it shaking, holding it there. <laughs> it's so heavy. Um, but yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I will wrap it up. Otherwise I'm just rambling and not really giving you any good content. Um, so can, do I recommend it? Um, I think you have to be a bit crazy. I, I don't think I can recommend this lens at full price. I think there are some fine alternatives, but I don't regret it. I, I bought this at such a heavy uh, discounted price that I knew that even if I sold it used, I'd probably make a profit on it. As it's turned out though, uh, this is not leaving my, back, my, my, my system. And it's actually really rounded out my Fuji um, experience on that platform because some of the times I felt it was all with Fuji I was getting a a weird a weird scenario where they love to push this film sim stuff but then they they don't give you like a, a natural vignette and camera that you can apply and and they have clinical perfected lenses for a filmic look which to me is a bit of a, a juxtaposition a bit of an oxymoron um, I will do a video in future about lens corrections and whether it's maybe a good idea to actually turn them off if you want to strive for a certain look because I've done some brief testing with that and some of that natural distortion you can obviously still tame it a little bit in, in Lightroom but I think it does resolve things quite differently when you start turning that stuff off. Um, we'll save that talk for another day but um, I, I just back to this lens I feel as though my Fuji kit is much more complete by having this lens in in with my system i i feel like i want to stay with fuji a lot longer because of this lens and i think that says something that speaks volumes i'm i enjoy having you know i've got the xf 90 mil f2 i've got the zeiss twit 32 1.8 and this I'm filming on the 16 1.4. I've got the 50 F2. I've got lots of lenses that I love from Fuji and they all have different tasks and they're, and they're good for autofocus and other needs. But I'm very glad to have this lens because I think it does provide a very different look entirely. And I think that kind of complements you know, your portfolio or your work that you're gonna do for clients and things like that. So I will leave it there. I do recommend it. Can't really recommend it at the price tag it's at though. Unfortunately, it's just really exclusive. You have to have very deep pockets and be a little bit insane when it comes to rendering and looks to go down this rabbit hole. Um, I'm insane to a certain degree and that's why it's, I've got it in my hands, but there is a limit and, and the price tag it's, it sits at is that limit. I should mention just briefly before I go, I think that uh, Kipon are offering a kind of trade-in service, which I'm very happy to see. So if you have been somebody who's bought the version one or two, I think you can send that lens or maybe not send it back, but you can um, prove that you've purchased it or something and they will give you this lens at half price, which is a fantastic idea actually, I think, to encourage brand loyal, uh, loyalty or customer loyalty with a, with a company rather than making people pay the same thing again and again and again. So good, that's a very good idea. I'd like to see more of that kind of stuff happening. Um, and lastly, build quality. The Kipon did send this lens out in uh, promptly in a nice um, box. But of course, the very first thing I did was just open the box and the lid just came right off. It's, <laughs> it's stuck on 
with glue and it came off um not a, not a great first impressions and then the the little pouch that they, they brought the um that the lens comes with uh, even on the very first opening it was starting to, to fray i don't know if you can see that see that in the images but there's um there's some fraying there uh, on the zip if the lens will focus there you go you can see the kind of fraying there against my forehead and just like the stitching is just not not great at all um luckily for me i really don't give two shits you know about this sort of stuff i'm i'm not into all that as long as i let i once i get a get a, a lens this stuff just goes away in storage um mm -hmm. in case i ever sell it i don't use the pouches or anything like that and i can just glue this lid back on you know i don't really care about that kind of stuff i care about the actual build quality of the lens and in that respect it's absolutely fine um I think I don't know if I've already touched on lens baby. Maybe I'm talking and repeating myself here, but I've shot lens baby lenses in the past. They also are kind of interesting lenses where they can be artistic and also behave a little bit when stopped down. But unfortunately, I can't really endorse lens baby there. The build quality I've had, I've had um, a lens baby 56, Velvet 85, uh, Burnside 35. There's always there's been a build quality issue with all of them. And for the kind of prices that they're asking for their lenses, I think that's a bit cheeky. Um, I, I've not just had this lens a couple of weeks. I've been using this lens now for um, three three months, I think, or if not longer. Um, is not it's there's absolutely not a single concern for build quality. I'm not finding the focus ring is getting more loose or the aperture ring is getting wobbly or anything. It just seems to be at least this this month this far into usage to be an absolutely fine. And it does feel premium. I also appreciate the fact that it doesn't seem to be a fingerprint magnet for despite this kind of matte um or not matte but this type of metal material, it does seem to be um I never find myself having to wipe it or clean it or anything like that. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, I am. I know I'm rambling. I'm going to shut up. Leave me a comment in the section below. I'll link a, a, the blog where I'll have some sample images. Maybe you can have a look at them and digest the images a little bit more. And I'll update that as I take more images with this lens uh, going forward, especially in a professional sense. Just haven't had the chance really to take it to weddings or not had the moment to really think it would, it would be better than using something else. So... Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I'm looking at my timer. I'm about 28 minutes, so um, including the intro. Yeah, we're getting on under 40 minutes. That's way too long. Apologies. All right. Till next time, take care and uh, goodbye.